Questions oral, oral questions. The Honourable Member for Edmonton Millwoods. Madam Speaker, Conservatives have repeatedly warned this government that their reckless spending would fuel inflation. They said that it wouldn't, and yet here we are. The cost of everything has gone up. When will this government take real action to help Canadian families that are struggling to, to afford the most basic items like groceries? Madam Speaker, it's a real pleasure to see you today uh, in this session, and I want to congratulate you. Madam Speaker, uh, to answer the question of my colleague, and I'm very happy, and I hope there's a lot of questions about the economy today, Madam Speaker, because we have very good news to share with Canadians who are watching at home today. Thanks to the hard work of Canadians, Madam Speaker, in November, Canada added 154,000 jobs, Madam Speaker, which is five times more than some had forecasted to our economy. Madam Speaker, our plan is working, our economy is growing. Honourable Member for Edmonton Millwoods. Madam Speaker, as they say, small businesses are the backbone of an economy, and we need to help them thrive to help get our economy back on track. But because of liberal inflation, labour shortages and rising shipping costs, many businesses are struggling just to stay open. Why does this government continue to ignore the needs of Canadian small businesses? The Honourable Minister. I'd like to thank the member for his very good question. We all appreciate and understand in this House that small businesses, small and medium-sized businesses, are the backbone of our economy, Madam Speaker. And that's why that during this pandemic, Madam Speaker, you will recall, this government was there to support them at every step of the way. One thing we said to small business is that we will have your back as long as it takes to make sure that we go through this pandemic together, and we'll continue to support them, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member for Edmonton Millwoods. Madam Speaker, just this morning, analysis from National Bank Financial revealed that for the first time in decades, private sector investment in Canada has actually shrunk. Canadian factories are currently operating with the lowest capital stock in 35 years. The Liberals have made it harder to open and to operate a business in Canada. When are the Liberals going to realize that the just inflation economy is slowly destroying Canadian jobs? Honourable Minister. Speaker, and I'm very, very happy uh, for the member's question and to talk about the economy this morning because I have other good news, Madam Speaker. And in fact, Madam Speaker, 106% of the jobs have been recovered since the pandemic, Madam Speaker. This is astonishing. And this is thanks to Canadian workers, Canadian business, and that compares to 83%, Madam Speaker, south of our border. Madam Speaker, we will continue to invest in workers, we'll continue to invest in our economy. And one thing that Canadians watching at home understand is that our plan is working, Madam Speaker. For six years, the Liberal government, especially over the last few months, has led to a trend. The government spends a lot of money, prints a lot of money, borrows a lot of money. One, two, three. Three aspects that mean that Canada is dealing with the worst inflation crisis since 2003. Every Canadian family is paying more and dealing with a higher cost of living. Could the Liberal government commit to just one small responsible thing? Is the government ready to control their expenditures? The Honourable Minister. Madame la Présidente, j'aimerais remercier. I would like to thank my Honourable colleague for Louis Saint Laurent, for whom I have a great deal of respect. I am pleased because this morning he's giving me the opportunity to share great news with the House and Canadians. Thanks to the hard work of Canadians, in November, Canada added 154,000 jobs. That's five times higher than some forecasts. If there's one thing that Canadians are seeing, it's that our plan is working because our economy is growing. The Honourable Member for Louis Saint Laurent. Well, Madam Speaker, I invite my colleague to go somewhere where they're distributing food baskets and say that. Everything's going well. No, things are not going well. Families are suffering more, are paying more, and that's true for every Canadian family. In my riding, 
There's a relief assistance organization, Amélie Frédéric, that's noted a 25% increase in requests for food baskets. 25%! That is the reality of inflation. The director of Amélie Frédéric said that our donors of yesterday are recipients today. The Honourable Minister. I'd like to thank the member for Louis Saint Laurent. And I understand that I distributed food baskets to families in need earlier this year, but if there's one thing that Canadians will remember about this government, it's that when there was a pandemic in Canada, we were there to support them. We were there for families, we were there for workers, and we were there for businesses. The best thing we can do, and I would give some advice to the member in opposition, is to support Bill C-2, which will continue to help families and workers in Canada. The Honourable Member for Saint-Jean. Madam Speaker, for eight months, the government has been hiding information about what led to the firing of two scientists at Canada's top secret virus research centre. For eight months, the government has refused to produce documents that would have shed light on possible espionage for China. Now it's changing its mind and offering to present documents to opposition parties, but in an extremely restricted and controlled way. The government leader calls this a gesture of good faith. Does this mean that for the past eight months, the government's been acting in bad faith? Le ministre. The Honourable Minister. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker. The balance between ensuring the House has access to all documents uh, and ensuring that national security interests are protected is absolutely paramount to this government. Uh, that's why we suggested that the National Security Committee of Parliamentarians be used uh, so that members of Parliament could have access to all documents in an unrestricted way. Opposition parties said that that wasn't enough, and uh, we're willing to go further. Uh, so we're suggesting the model that was used for Afghan detainees in 2010 as the way to proceed. Uh, I look forward to talk. L'honorable député de Saint-Jean. The honorable member for Saint-Jean. Mal de se poser des questions. It's normal to ask questions. Scientists that appear to have ties to the Chinese regime had access to the most confidential secrets had to be fired. But instead of uh, being transparent and offering answers, the Prime Minister first called the opposition racist and even went to court to prevent you from demanding documents this House was asking for. It's like Canadians suing a referee to prevent him from applying the rules. Does the government realize that the public has a right to the truth and that opacity only encourages speculation? The Honourable House Leader. Merci beaucoup, Madame la Présidente. Et c'est absolument clair que toute l'information est, est, est disponible pour uh, le député, mais uh, c'est essentiel. It's absolutely clear that the information is available to members, but we need a system or... Pardon? We need a system where we can check information with members in a safe way. These documents have to do with national security. We need a system to protect our national security. New day. A new dark chapter for armed violence in Montreal. A 30-second murder happened in Montreal. Nearly 60 weapons were seized at the border, and they were destined for Montreal streets. There are too many weapons still in circulation. At the border, we need more resources in order to protect our children. If that's enough, will the minister commit today to taking real measures to stop the trafficking of illegal weapons at our border? The Honourable Minister. I want to thank my colleague for his question. Every case is one too many. We're taking steps to fight this type of violence and we're making significant investments. We've established a working group with the United States and I will be consulting my Quebecois counterpart later today. Madam Speaker, health experts have told us that if countries like Canada do not work urgently to get vaccines to the world's most vulnerable populations, dangerous variants like Omicron will continue to develop. 
the global impacts will be dire. More people will die. And the COVID-19 nightmare will continue. Canadians want to get back to normal, but that won't happen unless everyone, everywhere, has access to the vaccine. The Liberal government is moving way too slow. Will the government scale up production, waive patent restrictions, and make sure vaccine... L'honorable ministre, the honorable minister. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I thank my honourable colleague for the important question and for her advocacy on this very important issue. It is precisely why, from the very beginning, Canada stepped up when in, in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. It is precisely why we helped found, support, and also co-chair the COVAX AMC group, and it is exactly why we have donated millions of vaccines to the developing world, because we understand that until we end this pandemic everywhere, we don't end it anywhere. Thank you, Madam. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Kelowna Lake Country. Madam Speaker, small businesses have struggled through an enormously challenging year. On December 31st, they'll be ready to toast a more prosperous and brighter new year. But who will be knocking on their doors when the clock strikes midnight? The Liberal tax collector. The New Year's hangover this year will be the CPP increase. After such a difficult 2021, why are the Liberals increasing CPP taxes on businesses? Great the Honourable Minister. Madam Speaker, it's a real pleasure to be raising in this House again today. Madam Speaker, I think the member is misleading in the question, Madam Speaker. In fact, uh, no, in fact, Madam Speaker, this is not an increase, Madam Speaker. This is not a tax, Madam Speaker. And we will make sure that we will be there. What Canadians understand, Madam Speaker, is that we have been through them, we have been with them at every step of the way during this pandemic, and we'll continue to be there for small and medium-sized businesses, Madam Speaker. Honourable Member for Kelowna Lake Country. Well, Madam Speaker, the government says the January 1st payroll tax hikes are necessary, but a payroll tax needs a payroll to tax. Statistics Canada's most recent survey of business conditions say that one in four businesses expect their profitability to be down by the end of the year. And there's been many times this year where more businesses have closed than opened. Is the government not concerned? that a higher tax in this country's current economic conditions could cause further small businesses to fold. The Honourable Minister. Madam Speaker, I'd like to thank the member for the question because it gives me a chance to explain to this House and to Canadians who are watching at home this morning, Madam Speaker. One thing that Canadians and small businesses across this nation will remember, Madam Speaker, is that we have been with them at every step of the way to this pandemic, Madam Speaker, at the start, during the pandemic, and will continue. One piece of free advice I have for the Conservative, Madam Speaker, if they are genuine in wanting to help small businesses in Canada, why don't they support Bill C2 instead of voting against like they did yesterday. The Honourable Member for Hastings, Lennox and Addington. Madam Speaker, elder abuse manifests itself in many forms. Financial, emotional, mental and physical abuse is rampant against Canadian seniors and it is only increasing. In the last Parliament, this House unanimously agreed to M203. Among other things, this Conservative-led initiative called for legislation to combat seniors' fraud. This was over two years ago. When will this government take meaningful action and introduce legislation to protect Canadian seniors? Minister. is totally unacceptable and is an, issue, and is an issue that is extremely important to our government and an issue that we all take very seriously. We're working on initiatives to combat seniors' abuse, including strengthening the law, creating a national definitions and better data collection, Madam Speaker. This builds on the work that we're already doing with the National Seniors Council uh, projects, uh, Madam Speaker, such as New Horizons for Seniors Program, help raise awareness around seniors' abuse. And I hope the Honourable Member and indeed all members in this House uh, apply for the call for proposals for New Horizons for Seniors program. The deadline is December 21st, and I hope all members apply. The Honourable Member for ha Hastings, Lennox, Lemington. Madam Speaker, last week I rose in this place to ask the government when they were going to rectify their GIS clawback that is currently gripping 
vulnerable seniors. Yeah. The Deputy Prime Minister, in the process of deflecting the question, tendered a one-time payment of $500 as some sort of compensation. Our seniors are losing up to nine times that amount because of this clawback. I ask again, when will this government show compassion and step up? Our seniors need it, and they deserve it. Yeah. Honourable Minister. We all know just how challenging this pandemic has been on seniors. And Madam Speaker, every single step of the way, this government has been there to support seniors, especially those most vulnerable by strengthening their GIS. We moved very quickly, Madam Speaker, to provide immediate and direct financial support to seniors. When it comes to the CERB GIS issue, Madam Speaker, we are aware of this issue, and I can assure the honorable member that we're working on this issue to find the right solution to support those affected. As always, Madam Madam Speaker, we will be there for our seniors. Honourable député de Bellechasse, les Etchemins Bonsoir, Madame la Présidente. Hier, les... Yesterday, U.S. countervailing duties on Canadian lumber doubled. I spoke last night with the Quebec Forest Industry Council, which is very alarmed for these businesses that create 60,000 direct and indirect jobs. The money that these companies make is being swallowed up at, by American Customs instead of being reinvested. Many of them are family-owned businesses like DG in saint aurélie Dacom in Saint-Just, or Cyril Aimé in Sainte-Marie. What does the Prime Minister intend to do to convince the American President to back down? The Honourable Minister. Madame la Présidente, je remercie ma collègue. I would like to thank my colleague for her question. I'm from Mauricie, and so I know the forestry industry quite well. There's even a f forest school in my riding. But what she should know is that the Minister for International Trade is in Washington today to defend of forestry workers. What people need to understand is that we will always be there to defend the forestry industry, workers in this industry, I'm ready to work. Madam Speaker, inflation is hitting Canadians hard. Home ownership is in doubt for many. U.S. countervailing duties on softwood lumber have made the situation worse. And add in a possible rise in interest rates and the storm will be complete and brutal. The Prime Minister needs to get his act together, take leadership on this issue, and get this decision reversed. How does he plan to do that? The, Minister. the Honourable Minister. Madame la présidente, chose que les... If there's one thing that Canadians know, it's that on this side of the House, we know how to defend businesses, businesses and industries' interests. We demonstrated that in the steel file and the aluminum file. When I was running out of breath earlier, what I was trying to say is that the Minister for International Trade is in Washington to defend the interests of forestry workers and to defend the interests of the industry as a whole. That's what we're doing today, and it's what we're going to continue to do. It happened again. Gun violence struck in Montreal once again. Yesterday, a 20-year-old man was shot and killed. A 17-year-old teenager was also injured. It happened in the middle of the street in a residential neighborhood at 7.15 p.m. Madam Speaker, families in Montreal are afraid. They're afraid of losing their children, afraid of being hit by stray bullets, afraid of being in the wrong place at the wrong time, even though they're in their own neighborhoods. The minister knows he has a duty to act, but does he also understand the urgency? The Honourable Minister. Madam Speaker, we agree that it's important to have working groups at the border, and they've been in place for some time now. This week, over 60 firearms were seized, thanks to a partnership between RCMP, Sûreté du Québec, and Montreal's police force. We're going to mobilize everything we can to ensure that our children and our families can be safe. Thank you. Madam Speaker, this was the 32nd homicide in Montreal this year, and we've still got a month to go. 
I welcome the seizures, but more needs to be done. I welcome the minister's openness to attending the summit convened by the mayor of Montreal at the end of January, but we need to act faster. The government of Quebec announced $46 million this morning for violence prevention. We feel the urgency to act, but we feel it less in Ottawa. What is the minister going to do today to demonstrate that he understands this urgency? The Honourable Minister. Madam Speaker, we will continue to fight the trafficking of weapons at the border, and we want to end violence in our communities. We promise to invest a billion dollars into the provinces and municipalities in order to eliminate handguns. As I've already said, I have a virtual meeting with my counterpart in Quebec to find more real solutions that we can implement on the ground. Thornhill. Madam Speaker, in times of doubt and uncertainty, Canadians can rely on one thing from this government, more confusion. Yesterday, the U.S. announced new travel restrictions for Canadians. On our side, the minister announced new testing measures for all travellers coming here. He didn't say who would administer the test. He didn't say where travellers would have to isolate. He didn't say when these measures would begin. And he didn't tell airports or airlines. So I have a few simple questions questions for the minister. Who, what, where, when and how will Canadians get details on this new plan? The Honourable Minister. Thank you. I'm very pleased to answer this question very quickly. This is the first time I've had a chance to rise in this house. I want to welcome the new pages who are here. I mention it because the member for Hull Aylmer and myself were pages many years ago. We know just how important this responsibility is. And we are grateful for everything the pages do. Now, when it comes to the question, our decisions are science-based and we're going to protect everyone's health and safety. Monsieur, Madame la Présidente. Madam Speaker, the Liberal government announced last week stricter borders at stricter measures at the border in order to deal with the new variant. As requested by the Conservative opposition and a week later, we can see there's a gap between what the Minister of Health says and what's really happening. No consultation with airports, no consultation with provinces regarding on arrival tests. In short, it's a shambles. Is the Minister of Health aware that improvisation has no place in public health and in protecting Canadians Overall, the Honourable Minister. Thank you. I'm delighted to have the first question from my colleague, the Conservative critic on health and safety. Very quickly, the first thing I want to say is that everything we do is science-based. And now, there's some confusion. I regret to say that just a few days ago, my colleague was requesting the cessation of all tests at the border. It's interesting to know how Conservative MPs have received uh, vaccinations in the country. The Honourable Member for Thornhill. I wouldn't add to the confusion. Canadians are stranded in South Africa. They're desperately trying to get assistance from this government. Yes. They're having to jump through hoops just to find an affordable PCR test or a safe flight back home. Instead, their calls for action have gone unanswered by this government, and it's scrambling to provide them clear, uh, clear guidance. Does the minister have a plan to help bring these stranded Canadians home, or are they just going to keep sending those calls to voicemail? Madam Speaker, and I'm again very pleased to be able to say a bit more on that. Uh, we are delighted to work very well and very constructively with airports across Canada, with public health officials. Uh, I'm also pleased to remind every Canadian that you know, the best way to protect ourselves is following public health measures and be vaccinated. And talking about a call to action, what about the action of Conservative MPs who have not yet been able to benefit from the 61 million doses already administered to Canadians. Talking about being slow, this government has been slow to act. Everybody recognizes that they were slow to act at the beginning of the pandemic, slow at the border, slow with vaccines. To this day, no one seems to know who's going to pay for on-arrival tests for international travels. The health minister said on Wednesday it's going to take a long time to set up. It will take time. Really? 20 months later, haven't they learned anything yet? The Liberals don't understand that time is what counts the most to avoid a fifth wave. Why are the Liberals so slow to act? 
Madam Speaker, I am so pleased to answer this question. Just a few months ago, my colleague and his colleague for Calgary Nose Hill were saying that Canadians should wait and are going to be waiting until 2030 to get vaccinated. I am pleased to remind my colleagues that we are among the most advanced countries when it comes to vaccination. But we might have to wait until 2030 for all the Conservative MPs to get vaccinated. Vancouver East. The Liberal government has failed to meet even one-tenth of their commitment of protecting Afghan refugees. Their continued insistence on layers of red tape have left tens of thousands of Afghans fleeing the Taliban unable to get to safety. With each passing day, Afghan collaborators, human rights advocates, judges, women and girls face heightened risks. Will the Liberals simplify documentation requirements, waive the need for refugee status determination, as was done for the Syrian Refugee Initiative, grant temporary resident permits for those in need and increased staffing for processing. Honourable Minister. Madam Speaker, I want to begin by thanking my colleague for her question and for her advocacy on addressing the humanitarian crisis situation in Afghanistan. And of course, we express solidarity with all uh, who remain there, and we are working day and night to continue to bring Afghan refugees to Canada. In fact, Madam Speaker, I'm pleased to inform the Chamber that just yesterday we welcomed an additional 243 Afghan refugees in Canada. Excellent. Which is not to say that there isn't more work to do, Madam Speaker, and this government will do that work in partnership with everyone, including the Canadians who wish to see us fulfill that goal. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member for Winnipeg Centre. Madam Speaker, this week a PBO report showed that women are still not being paid equally in Canada and many won't see pay equity until 20. 29. That is eight years from now. Remember when the Prime Minister said gender equity was important because it was 2015? Six years later, this Liberal government and women are still waiting for pay equity because of their failure to act. Incremental justice is unacceptable. When will the Liberals correct course so women get pay equity? The Honourable Minister. I would like to thank the Honourable Member opposite, uh, the NDP critic, for the question and thank her for it and want to let her know that we have women's backs and have had women's backs, Mr. Speaker. We have seen the equity and the gaps in real time. We know that we had to act and we did. A hundred million dollars, Mr. Sp Madam Speaker, to shelter organizations because we knew that women were at risk, women fleeing intimate violence were at risk, and that's what we did. When it comes to gender-based violence, $3.8 billion, Mr. Madam Speaker, is going towards that, and we have women's backs and will. I look forward to meeting, meeting my provincial member for Winnipeg South. Pandemic. The economies of the Prairie Provinces, including my home province of Manitoba, have been some of the hardest hit. Because of the strong advocacy of our Manitoba caucus, a new regional development agency specific to the Prairies was announced by our government. Could the minister responsible for prairie economic development please update this house on how Prairies Can has supported businesses throughout our fight against COVID-19? The Honourable Minister. Madam Speaker, let me first congratulate uh, the member on his re-election and the fine work that he's done both in the city of Winnipeg and on the prairies. Uh, as noted by him, Prairies Can was created over the summer to, uh, to address the unique needs of the prairies and focus on local priorities. Through this pandemic, Prairies Can has provided more than $461 million of new money, supporting uh, close to 7,000 businesses on the prairies. Wow. Additionally, through Budget 2021, uh, we have announced $360 million of new money. Uh, to support uh, businesses and workers on the ground. Prairies Can will... The Honourable Member for South Surrey White Rock. Madam Speaker, Russia's Foreign Minister has just told our Foreign Affairs Minister that the nightmare of military confrontation is returning. The Prime Minister has reportedly told Ukraine's President that Canada will use every single tool possible to deter Russia. With 115,000 
Russian soldiers and thousands of tanks and armored vehicles at Ukraine's border, CDS Air said Canada will offer no CAF support. I asked the minister again, as I did yesterday, who is in charge and how will Canada defend democratic Ukraine? The Honourable Minister. Madam Speaker, I thank my honourable colleague for that question again. And I will just say that since 2015, under Operation Unifier, Canada has been steadfast in its support of the Ukraine with troops on the ground, undertaking training exercises day in and day out. We stand with our Ukrainian partners as well as our NATO allies in terms of presenting a united front against unwarranted Russian aggression. And we will continue to work on a multilateral basis to uphold the international rules-based order, peace and democracy. Thank you, yeah. Madam Speaker. A member for Saskatoon University. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Just last year, this government said that there's no path to net zero without nuclear. But when it comes to nuclear energy and SMRs, the new environmental minister is hiding both in virtually and in reality. I'd like to congratulate Ontario for selecting GE Hitachi last year as the design partner for SMRs. And I would like to know if our new Minister of the Environment will continue hiding from nuclear energy or will he take the opportunity today and congratulate Ontario. The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, our government has developed an ambitious climate plan, one of the world's most detailed and concrete plans. In that transition towards a net zero future, we must consider all non-emitting technologies, including wind, solar, hydro, and yes, nuclear energy. It is certainly an important part of the mix uh, right now that exists in this country. And we have been supporting the development and the assessment of small modular reactors. I had a very good conversation with my counterpart in Ontario, and I did indeed congratulate him on a, an important step forward in the development of this technology. Can we lower the rhetoric, please? And let the minister answer so we can all hear the answer. Uh, the Honourable Member from Montmagny, Lilel Camorasca Rivière du Loup. Madam Speaker, in a joint announcement with Quebec on August 6th, the government committed to reviewing its immigration regulations, particularly with regard to temporary foreign workers. And they proposed increasing the acceptable threshold of uh, temporary foreign workers within companies from 10 to 20 percent. Despite the rhetoric, there's been very little concrete action. After four months of very little news, will they finally do their job? And will this become effective on December 6th? Yes or no? The Honourable Minister. Madame the President, je tiens à... Madam Speaker, I want to thank my colleague for the question. We've worked closely uh, between the federal government and the uh, government of Quebec, which has the jurisdiction of setting immigration targets. In terms of the percentage of temporary foreign workers, yes, there is a, a pilot project in the works. We will continue to work with our Quebec counterparts to deliver the goods and to deliver the immigration that Quebec needs. Thank you. For Sturgeon River Park. Sturgeon River Park. The price of everything is rising under the inflationary policies of this Liberal government, and few have been harder hit than Canadian farmers. The price of fuel and drying grain have skyrocketed because of this escalating Liberal carbon tax. Now the Liberals are proposing a whopping 30% decrease in fertilizer emissions. We know the impact on farmers and families will be devastating. Less food production and higher prices on the grocery shelves. Why is this Liberal government deliberately undermining the food security of Canadian families? The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Canadian farmers are important stewards of the land. Yes, we have set a national target for emission reduction for, from fertilizer. And actually, the Western producers conducted a little informal survey about the 30% target. And uh, hear what they say. We asked a dozen soil nutrition experts, including 10 retail, independent, and federal government agronomists, to weigh in on this issue. Most agreed that Ottawa's emission reduction goal was achievable and does not require making do with less fertilizer. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honorable Member for Shefford. Madam Speaker, 
since the summer, the Bois Québécois has been asking the government to stop unfairly cutting the guaranteed income supplement for older workers who were entitled to the CERB. We've been told that the minister is working on a solution, but it's taking far too long. The GIS is a benefit for the poorest seniors. The hundreds of dollars that Ottawa is taking back from them every month, these people can't just charge it to their credit card while they wait for Ottawa to step in. These people are making sacrifices month after month and having to make more and more difficult decisions. When will the minister take action? Honourable Minister. Speaker, from the very beginning, our government's priority has been to support seniors, especially those most vulnerable. That is why we've worked extremely hard to strengthen income security for seniors, including their GIS. Madam Speaker, we created benefits like CERB to help people at the height of this pandemic. We know it's having an impact on some, some of our most vulnerable now. And I can assure the honorable member that we're actively working on a solution to ensure that we fight for those most vulnerable. We're always going to be there for, to support those most vulnerable seniors. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member for Shefford. Madam Speaker, the Prime Minister confirmed on Wednesday that the Minister was working on a solution to this injustice. That's good. But today, seniors have a right to demand that the Minister tell them exactly what this supposed solution actually is. It's simple. We need to ensure that the CERB is considered as employment income for the purpose of calculating the GIS, and we need to ensure that seniors can demand a recalculation based on their current income. Will the minister confirm that this is exactly what she is working on, and can she tell us when she will have a result? The Honourable Minister. Madam Speaker, as I mentioned, we're working to find the right solution to support seniors affected by the GIS that changes due to pandemic benefits. But Madam Speaker, let me remind the Honourable Member the number of things that we've done to help seniors. We've increased support through OAS for those 75 and above. We've strengthened GIS for vulnerable single seniors. We provided one-time payments during the pandemic to help seniors afford the things that they need, Madam Speaker. We have an ambitious agenda for seniors, and we will always, always support seniors. Thank you. The Honourable the honorable Member for Charles, Charleswood, uh, St. James, the Cinnaboya, Headingley. Madam Speaker, Norway, Poland, Singapore, Mexico, Russia, Brazil, Indonesia, Argentina, the Philippines, India, Pakistan, Ukraine, New Zealand, a country the Finance Minister says is very much like Canada, they all have the same thing in common. They have increased interest rates as a result of inflation. What is the plan to protect Canadians when interest rates inevitably rise in Canada? Or is it just interest? Oh, the Honourable Minister. Madam Speaker, it's quite a pleasure to see you again this morning. And I'm happy to see that my honourable colleague wants to talk about geography, Madam Speaker. Let me mention a few countries, the United States, Mexico, Germany, the Eurozone, and New Zealand. What do they have in common, Madam Speaker? More inflation than in Canada, Madam Speaker, because in fact, the member would well know that the latest inflation number in Canada was 4.7 percent, Madam Speaker. What Canadians understand at home is that we have a plan to grow this, this economy and that our plan is working, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member for Niagara Falls. Madam Speaker, Canada's new PPE manufacturing industry is already in a state of crisis. These patriotic innovators answered the government's call to help Canadians when PPE supply was short and badly needed at the start of the pandemic. Despite the Prime Minister promising to buy Made in Canada PPE, all I can find in the parliamentary precinct are masks that are made in China. When will this Liberal government start supporting Canadian PPE innovators and manufacturers and stop breaking their promises. The Honourable Minister. In the House in the 44th Parliament, so I want to thank the good people of Hamilton West Ancaster yeah. Dundas for electing me. It truly is an honour. With respect to the member's question, Mr. Speaker, we, uh, Madam Speaker, we know that Canadian businesses have pivoted they retooled, and we have supported them every step of the way. We are in a position now where we are not short on PPE. Why? Because Canadian businesses stepped up, and our procurement efforts have supported those businesses. We're going to continue to do that, Madam Speaker. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Northumberland, South Peterborough. 
Okay, here. Thank, you. Thank you, Madam Speaker. When this Prime Minister called this unnecessary, unneeded election, federal development applications were put on hold. Three months after the election, these applications are still on hold, Madam Speaker. When will these applications, when will these applicants hear from this government? Here, here. The Honorable Minister. Madam Speaker, I'd like to thank the member for the very important question, Madam Speaker. What the members know is that on this side of the hall, we have been there for small businesses. We have been there for businesses throughout the pandemic. Madam Speaker, I take his question very seriously. If he has a case at point, we'll be happy to look at it on this side of the house and provide them a response. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honorable Member for Louis Hébert. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Once again, Montreal was uh, touched by a shooting of a, and a young man lost his life last night. It is imperative that our government take every step possible to put an end to this scourge of illegal uh, cross-border arms smuggling. So I'd like to ask the Minister of Public Safety to inf inform this House of what measures are being taken to protect Quebecers from illegal sm uh, illegally smuggled firearms. The Honourable Minister. Madam Speaker, I want to thank the member for the question. And uh, my thoughts are with the residents of Montreal who have all too often had to face armed violence, including most recently that last night. Almost 60 illegal firearms were seized at the border this week. Thanks to the colossal uh, collaborative work between the RCMP, the Sûreté du Québec, and the Montreal Police Force. We need to do everything within our power to ensure that our communities are kept safe. And as I said earlier today, Madam Speaker, I will be meeting virtually with my Quebec counterpart. The Honourable Member for Pelna Jacques Cartier. Thank you, Madam Speaker. This government needs to take the issue of official languages seriously. This week, the Commissioner tabled a report showing that Francophone immigration is way behind its targets. He said it's time to do better and time to do more. So why not kill two birds with one stone? Bring in French-speaking foreign workers to solve the labor shortage and increase the number of French-speaking citizens. I'd ask the Minister of Immigration to put in place more effective administrative measures to address the labor shortage now while increasing the presence of French in Canada. The Honourable Minister. Madam Speaker, our government recognizes that it has the responsibility to protect and promote the French language, not only outside of Quebec, but also within Quebec. A key aspect of promoting and protecting French is encouraging Francophone immigration in all of the regions of our country. This is something that we promised in our platform. And we will be moving forward with the establishment of a national ambitious strategy that will promote Francophone immigration outside of Quebec while continuing to uh, promote the French language among immigrants to Quebec. The Honourable Member for Chatham, Kent Limington. There are over 4,400 natural gas wells throughout southwestern Ontario, a number of which are in my riding, including the community of Wheatley which was rocked by a natural gas leak explosion this past summer. On August the 17th, the Ontario Petroleum Institute and the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry wrote to the Ministers of Natural Resources and Finance seeking to collaborate on the development of a program for Ontario's orphan wells. Will this government commit to working on this critical issue in southwestern Ontario? The Honourable Minister. The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Madam Speaker, um, and thank you to the Honourable Member for uh, for the question. Certainly, the issue of orphan wells and the environmental liabilities that they represent is a significant issue for uh, for all Canadians. Uh, we, as you know, introduced a program focused primarily on the Western provinces during a time of great financial crisis. Typically, the issue of the regulation uh, of uh, of oil and gas producing companies. Um, and the environmental liabilities associated with that rest at the provincial jurisdiction, but we are always happy to engage a conversation with our counterparts in provinces and territories when they raise concerns. The Honourable Member for Saskatoon University. Thank you, Madam Speaker. In their race to the moral high ground, the CBC has blindsided Canadians by appointing themselves Canada's ward monitor. 
They recently brainstormed a list of 18 words which should never be uttered. Now, I wonder if it was a real slow news day in the taxpayer-funded public broadcaster. But dictating a list of words is actually no substitute at all for the real work needed to end aggression. But does the Minister of Canadian Heritage actually think it's the job of the CV CBC to think for Canadians? Honorable Minister. The Honourable Minister. Merci, Madame la Présidente. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I want to thank my colleague for the question. They know well that Radio-Canada, CBC, is independent and makes its own decisions. And the Conservatives would love to cut CBC. They've said so many times in the past. I think that's concerning for our national broadcaster, Madam Speaker. I wonder if they still would love to make drastic cuts to the national broadcaster or if they've changed their position. St. John's East. Madam Speaker. 90% of Canadian seafood goes through small craft harbours, and Canada's fish harvesters depend on these facilities to support their livelihoods. In my riding, the Harbour Authority of Portugal Cove St. Phillips is the centre of community life and an industry hub for fishing, trade, um, shipping and other marine sectors. Can the Minister of Fisheries and Oceans please provide an update to this House on what our government is doing to support small craft harbours? Thank you. The Honourable Minister. Speaker, I would like to congratulate the new member from St. John's East for her election. And to thank her for her question and thank, to thank her for the hospitality she showed me when I visited Atlantic Canada just weeks after my appointment and uh, including to the harbour uh, of Portugal Cove St. Phillips and met with the authority members there in her riding. Small craft harbours, of course, play an integral role in many, many of our communities and their economies. Our government recognises their importance, and that's why through Budget 2021, we invested $300 million to repair and keep The Honourable Member for Timmins, James Bay. And we are Environment Minister announced that he has blown yet another deadline in dealing with the climate crisis. I mean, God help our planet. No wonder this government is now at the bottom of the G20 when it comes to renewables, right down there with Russia and Saudi Arabia. So while Joe Biden is committed to an energy transformation that's tied to good paying union jobs, our Prime Minister is tied to targets he keeps missing. So where is this plan to invest in the diversification using the skill and training of energy workers so that no region is left behind? The clock is ticking here. The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, uh, as my honourable colleague knows, Canada has developed a climate plan that is uh, perhaps one of the most detailed and comprehensive in the world. I would invite him to actually read the document. Canada also, I would remind him, has one of the cleanest grids in the world as it exists today. Uh, actually, more than 80% of Canada's power comes from non-emitting sources, the vast majority of it from renewables, which is one of the highest levels of renewable production anywhere in the world. But we certainly understand that there is more that needs to be done. We will be bringing forward an enhanced reduction plan associated with uh, our commitments under the net zero legislation, and we will be working to ensure that there is economic prosperity. And that is all the time we have for all questions today. To the talking to ask for the questions, 